could possibly be worse than P. Diddy's allegations of sex parties, celebrity and politician blackmail, drug mules, and human trafficking? Well, there's tons of videos out there to catch you up on all those allegations, but we're here to go over what nowhere near enough people are talking about. Diddy is actually linked to multiple murders. And the more you dig, the more you realize all of this has been in front of our faces the whole time. So the main questions are obvious. How many deaths are we talking about? Which suspicious deaths is Diddy even associated with? And if he is potentially at fault, how did he get away with it for so long? Plus, could anyone be in danger right now? I'm gonna answer all of those, but to be clear up front, a lot of this is coming from personal testimonies, many of which are on record with law enforcement. But the reason these allegations are so interesting is that the exact same people making these accusations also accused Diddy years ago of the exact things he's being investigated for right now. So their track records do seem to have at least some amount of credibility. So let's dive into the police reports, eyewitness accounts, and the surprisingly long list of suspicious deaths to get to the bottom of this. By the way, quick disclaimer, this is all very serious stuff, so I'm gonna be saying the word allegedly a lot. So I don't know if you're into drinking games or something, but you can go nuts with that. All right, so P. Diddy had a bit of a unique start to his career, and it really shaped how he viewed the music industry. He was born in Harlem, but his mom worked hard to move them to Mount Vernon by the time he reached middle school. Though he still visited his family in Harlem often, Mount Vernon was a safer environment and provided better educational opportunities, which helped him get into Howard for undergrad. In only his freshman year at Howard, at 19 years old, Diddy's music producer dreams hit a huge breakthrough. He not only got his friend Heavy D to introduce him to Andre Harrell, the founder of Uptown Records, but Diddy scored an internship with Andre too. But here's where it starts to get weird. Apparently Diddy did so well at this internship that Andre decided he had to have him permanently. But Diddy was only going into his sophomore year of college, so his mom reasonably said, no, stay in school. So Andre had Diddy commuting back and forth twice a week, four hours each way to stay in the internship. And before long, Andre finally convinced him to quit Howard and join Uptown full time. So Diddy went on to an entry level job, right? Wrong. Andre promoted Diddy, a 20-year-old kid at the time, from intern directly to vice president of Uptown Records. I know, how did this happen? Well, Jaguar Wright, an R&B singer who was Diddy's assistant back in the day, came forward with a possible explanation, one that's actually been backed up by other rumors and comments people have made over the years. But just to be clear, I'm throwing up our rumors flag in the corner. And a quick note, this clip also makes mention of the legendary music producer Clive Davis, who came out as bisexual in 2013. He loves the ability to manipulate and control people. Why? Most likely because he was victimized by his mentor, Andre Harrell, who was mentored by Clive Davis. Don't tell me that Andre Harrell got by Clive Davis too. Now, I will say Clive Davis and Andre being connected like that is something I could only find Jaguar saying. But Diddy being preyed on by Andre was also backed by Kim Porter, Diddy's longtime off and on girlfriend and mother of his children. Kim was one of Uptown's longest employees and allegedly she had video footage of multiple sexual encounters between Andre and Diddy while she and Diddy were together. Remember that. Though I do wanna quickly insert here that obviously the scandal is not about Diddy possibly being gay or bisexual. The scandal is A, cheating, but mostly B, using power dynamics to assault people, period. So if Jaguar is to be believed, then that would give an explanation for how Diddy could climb the ranks so fast. And it also would lend insight to why only a year or two later when Andre fired Diddy from Uptown, somehow out of that, Diddy was immediately offered his own record label, Bad Boy Records, fully funded by Clive Davis himself, which multiple people, including Suge Knight, have alleged was because Diddy had started doing favors for Clive instead. So I tell the homies, give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'm here because Clyde Davis called me and him and Puffy's real tight. 
and uh you know love it. but you know who else added fuel to the fire an mtv exec named terrence dean who wrote a tell-all in 2009 about how there was a huge secret gay culture in the hip-hop scene he doesn't name names in the book but he does give some hints but then in 2011 he wrote another book that is basically a fictionalized version of what he witnessed with fake names but supposedly very close to real life stories including a major producer who owns a record label named Aaron Tremble. Kind of sounds like Andre Harrell, doesn't it? Well, people are convinced that Aaron is based on Andre, and the character of Aaron sexually engages with young rappers, promising to make them stars. But nothing was ever confirmed outright, and the buzz around the book kind of got quiet until in 2020, he tweeted about turning it into a movie. Talk about widespread attention, especially considering rumors were still circulating about Diddy being gay or bi as early as the 90s and as recently as summer of 2022 when Cassie's new husband tried to out him on Instagram. So did the movie ever happen? Well, no, because Terrence Dean died inexplicably at the age of 53 in August 2022. Yes, Terrence died under interesting circumstances. Nobody actually knew anything about him being sick. You might be thinking, what? You really think Diddy did that? Well, Bear with me because things will start lining up. But back to Diddy's concerning timeline. Now that he had his own label, did Diddy break the cycle and create a safe work environment? Well, I think the recent lawsuits and investigations of human trafficking and sexually taking advantage of his subordinates kinda answers that one. So this whole warped and abusive power structure at Uptown Records is where Diddy could have learned that the industry, or at least his own twisted corner of it, is a system where not only could underlings be easily abused, it was a rite of passage, like a hazing ritual that makes you one of them. And it was even further affirmed to him when the alleged sexual favors for Clive gave him his own record label too. Diddy not only leaned into it, he developed a whole new business model off of it, throwing elaborate parties with sex workers, drugs, and alcohol. But those weren't the money makers. Because when Homeland Security searched Diddy's home, they found cameras in every room. And so the allegations are that a sizable and recurring chunk of Diddy's income came from running a blackmail operation against the individuals he had illicit footage on. I mean, it's not a bad plan. Get celebrities and politicians on tape doing things they regret, but all the while maintaining control. I mean, it was good enough for the corrupt moguls in Fall of the House of Usher. This is the real business. Is he here? Her dad's a congressman. This guy, he's a draft pick. His party's worth 2.5, but this footage, it's worth a whole lot more. But the parties weren't the only thing Diddy escalated. He also introduced a level of rivalry and violence unlike anything Andre or Clive had seen before. Now, I know when we talk about Diddy, we don't generally think of a violent person. He mastered the art of coming off as calm, collected, and full of love. He even changed his middle name to love in 2022. But he actually has an established history of violence. There's the domestic abuse allegations from many different partners. Cassie is just the latest to come forward in her recent lawsuit, naming everything from battery and assault to trafficking his own girlfriend. And Liza Gardner recently accused Diddy of choking her until she passed out. But the abuse goes all the way back to Kim Porter. One fan even remembered a now scrubbed from the internet story in 2005 where Diddy allegedly broke Kim Porter's nose on a yacht and they had to fly in a plastic surgeon to covertly fix it. But it's not just relationships. Diddy once got so mad that a producer wouldn't take a shot out of a music video, a shot that was Diddy's idea and the producer, Steve Stout, had to spend $14,000 on, mind you. Well, Diddy got mad enough that he allegedly stormed into Steve's office with backup and started beating the crap out of him. It's important to note that Steve did actually go to court over this, and Diddy ended up paying him millions to drop the charges. He said, one minute I'm in the middle of a meeting, and the next minute I'm down on the floor and Puffy and his guys are kicking and pounding me. One of them picks up a chair and throws it at me. Then Puffy throws my desk over and they just walk out like nothing happened. As far as I'm concerned, this was an attempt on my life. The only reason I'm not dead is because they missed. 
But yeah, this is a hot-tempered guy who's not afraid to get his hands dirty in a fit of rage. However, it's not just his hands that have gotten him in trouble. Diddy once, in a fit of jealousy over Cassie briefly dating Kid Cudi, threatened to blow up the fellow rapper's car. Which sounds like an empty threat someone just says, except according to Cassie's recent lawsuit, Diddy allegedly made sure that Kid Cudi was home with his friends, and just after that, Kid Cudi's car actually exploded. Not only that, but Diddy has had multiple incidents with guns. In 1997, Diddy and his love interest at the time, J-Lo, were out with two of Diddy's guys when an argument with a stranger over a spilled drink turned into gunfire. Three people were injured, including Natanya Rubin, who was shot in the face, but fortunately survived. Diddy and J-Lo were arrested as part of the group, but they were soon let go and everything got pinned on one of Diddy's rappers, Shine. Shine got sentenced to 10 years in prison, while Diddy faced no repercussions or charges, even after the cops found another gun in his car. Here's the thing though, the story was that Shine fired into the crowd and Diddy only fired at the ceiling. And you have said since really right after the shooting that it was P. Diddy who shot you. I said it immediately. I literally watched them pull out the guns. I've had a clear point of view. I mean, for God's sake, I got shot in my nose. And I wish that was the last of the gun incidents, but the recent lawsuit from Lil Rod, one of Diddy's producers, shed light on yet another one. He alleges that in 2022, while at a recording studio with Diddy, Diddy's son Justin brought his friend G along. Diddy and Justin ended up in a heated argument and stepped into a bathroom to hash it out. But the next thing Lil Rod knew, he heard gunshots and Diddy and Justin came rushing out of the bathroom, revealing G curled up in the fetal position, clutching his stomach as blood poured out of him. So did Diddy shoot him or is he teaching his son the same behavior? I don't know what's worse. Either way, one of the most worrying parts of the whole thing is that Lil Rod notes that when the LAPD showed up, the cops completely changed the whole story. Diddy not only had Lil Rod lie and say G had been shot outside in a drive-by, allegedly he even got G, the guy who is bleeding out on the floor, to back up this story too. And the LAPD went along with it. They didn't even note the blood Lil Rod said was all over the bathroom. And from their incident reports, the shooting didn't even happen near the studio. But even stranger is Lil Rod claims he carried G out to the ambulance, but there's no body cam footage from the LAPD, nor is there a 911 call. Is Diddy immune to the cops too? I mean, that's not once, but twice that he got away without so much as a mark on his record. Here's an important thing to know about Diddy to understand him psychologically. Through the 90s and early 2000s, references to mafia-style movies like Scarface and The Godfather were very prominent in the hip-hop scene. But another mafia movie that really resonated with Diddy, so much so that he optioned the rights to remake it, is called King of New York. And Diddy wasn't just going to remake it, he wanted to star in it. That's how much he identified with the story. So as we'll see, we can use this preference in movies and the classic mafia boss plot of King of New York to fully understand Diddy's motivation. We can surmise that Diddy had this grandiose idea of being on top. The only thing is, Diddy didn't grow up in a situation where he had to join gangs like a lot of the other rappers and artists he was representing. He'd had a doting mother who worked to get him into a safe neighborhood, a good education. He even would have gotten his college degree if Uptown hadn't offered him such a good deal. For Diddy, a movie like King of New York was a dramatization of a fantasy alternate universe version of himself, a hardened streetwise guy who'd literally done his time. The movie starts with the lead character, Frank White, getting out of jail, which is the total opposite of Diddy's actual life. He'd never been to prison, he didn't have to join a gang, he'd had a considerable amount of privilege. But what would Diddy do when he actually came face to face with people who came from a world of true organized crime?
In the early 90s, there were enormous tensions brewing between the East Coast rap scene centered in New York and most prominently represented by the rapper, the notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Smalls, and the West Coast rap scene, mainly associated with L.A. and Oakland, and including rappers Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, N.W.A., and most notably, Tupac Shakur. The West Coast crew was run by Suge Knight, a likely and even suspected leader of the West Coast gang, the Bloods. He was not someone to be messed with. But even with Suge's background, it's allegedly Diddy who started the lethal feud, going full king of New York to keep his secrets safe. Since I'm king in New York, Miami and LA. On November 30th, 1994, Tupac was called to Quad Studios in New York to record a verse for an artist signed with Uptown Records and associated with Diddy. And at this time, Tupac had been on relatively good terms with Biggie, one of Diddy's biggest artists and supposed best friend. But reportedly, Tupac said that all that night, Diddy kept blowing up his phone asking where he was at and was incredibly focused on what his exact time of arrival at Quad Studios would be, which was sus. And as for motive, the thing is, rumor has it that at this time, Tupac was digging around about Diddy's mistreatment of Usher and his possible molestation of the young male artists he'd taken under his wing. Pac went and studied all the facts. Pac was real smart. So before he say something, he'd go and do his homework. He'd say, okay, this guy right here, they say he gay, he go both ways. I'm not going to put it out there on yet. But I'm going to do my research. And if it's true, the world should know. And as soon as Tupac arrived at Quad Studios, three gunmen robbed him of $40,000 worth of jewelry and shot him five times in the lobby. Once in the hand, twice in the groin, and twice in the head. By the way, for those who are not as up on their history, that isn't even the time Tupac died. He somehow survived being shot five times, but the feud had officially started. With any love between Tupac and Biggie now gone, at the 1995 Source Awards, Suge's West Coast label Death Row Records didn't pull any punches. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, and won't have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, come to Death Row. But note, at that point, there still hadn't been any bloodshed from Suge's side, just Diddy's. And that continued. At rapper and producer Jermaine Dupri's birthday in Atlanta later that year, Suge and his entourage, including his close friend and fellow blood member, Big Jake, stormed into the party and confronted Diddy. The exchange resulted in them all getting kicked out, but as they were leaving, gunshots went off across the street. So they all duck down and look over to see what's going on. All it is is a man across the street shooting his gun into the air. But while everyone is distracted, a man walks right behind Big Jake. Bang. We looked, the dude came out of nowhere and just touched Jake. And Jake was about 400 pounds. But then a few days later, three witnesses reported that Puff's bodyguard Wolf was the assailant. Whoa. Did Puff's bodyguard take out Suge Knight's best friend? So yeah, Suge's close friend just happens to get shot while standing outside of a club right next to Diddy and his crew immediately after an altercation. It's never been confirmed, but a lot of people suspect Diddy's bodyguard is the one who shot Big Jake while everyone else was distracted. And that even raises the question, did Diddy know that Suge would probably show up to the party and plan all of this ahead of time? Either way, Suge's crew definitely didn't kill their own member, so what we're seeing is Diddy continuing to play with fire. At this point, Suge's crew has been attacked twice, but Diddy then decided to do a West Coast tour going straight into their territory. And what better bodyguards against Suge Knight's blood than their direct rival gang, the Crips? We're Crips, and Suge was blood. Oh, he pitted us against each other. And this is where it gets crazy. Allegedly, Diddy went to Crip member KPD and offered him a million dollars to take out both Suge and Tupac. That's right, allegedly he straight up hired a hitman. 
Later, when Tupac got in a scuffle with Keefe D's nephew, it's alleged that Keefe D's crew then followed Tupac down the Las Vegas Strip, pulled up next to him, and fired multiple rounds into the car, killing Tupac and wounding Shook. And by the way, the source of these rumors, it's Keefe D himself. And so if you believe Keefe D, which the cops sure do, considering he's now standing trial for the murder this June, then you have to remember, Keefe D claims that this hit job was based on direct orders from Diddy, the label owner who did not grow up in a gang, but wanted to play Mafia Don. He said he didn't give us anything for no music. Who brought up the amount of $1 million? He did. Puffy oh, did? Yeah. And it gets even worse. The next year, at the height of tensions, with everyone on the West Coast wanting revenge for Tupac's murder, for some reason Diddy adamantly wanted to go to an awards show in Los Angeles, despite everyone's constant warnings. But not only did he insist he was going, he insisted Biggie had to go too, despite having an international press junket in London already planned that would have really catapulted Biggie's international career, which is a good thing for Diddy too. But what's even weirder is it wasn't the awards show Diddy wanted Biggie to come to, it was the after party. After allegedly pushing and pushing, he literally pulled the boss card and forced Biggie to come to LA if only to go to the specific after party. It was that important to him, even with Biggie suffering a broken leg at the time. Big couldn't even walk, he couldn't run. They was pushing him around in a wheelchair, brother. The second time in six months, a star in the often brutal world of gangster rap has been gunned down. This time it was notorious B.I.G. To the public, Diddy was devastated. He even released the song I'll Be Missing You with Biggie's widow, Faith Evans, in honor of the slain rapper. And Diddy ran with this image everywhere. His supposed best friend had been killed, just like in King of New York when Frank White's partner in crime gets killed as payback for Frank's own misdeeds. But on the inside, a lot of people were wondering if he truly felt all that bad. I mean, after all, Diddy badgering Biggie about going to the party eerily mirrored how he was hounding Tupac for his timing before the Quad Studios attack. But why would Diddy want his own artist to be killed? Maybe Biggie was a sacrificial lamb. Puff ain't want the beef with the dog pound, snoop them or whatever. So what I'm gonna do is, y'all want the sheep? I'm gonna put them out the pasture. If you got that wolf in you, catch him if you can. It would make sense why Diddy was so insistent on Biggie coming to the after party. If Diddy went by himself after everything with Tupac, of course they'd come for him. But in a medieval sense of justice, the only thing better than getting Diddy would be getting the much more famous and beloved Biggie Smalls. Biggie was like the East Coast equivalent of Tupac, an eye for an eye. And he was incapacitated with his leg, so he made an even easier target. So not only do we have testimony from the hitman himself alleging that Diddy is the direct cause of Tupac's death and that he wanted Suge dead too, many people also suspect he had his best friend killed as well. And then Puff came back downstairs, he was heated. He said, something gotta change. I don't give a if Pac gotta die, Big gotta die, or Suge Knight go to jail. He said, Big gotta die? He said, yo, he said, Big. But even once the tensions of the East Coast, West Coast war faded, Diddy may have grown accustomed to dealing with problematic people in this same way. People around him just kept dying, especially people that posed a threat, including the mother of his children. Remember how I said Kim Porter allegedly had actual footage of Diddy and Andre together? Well, part of that allegation is that that footage was actually going to play a big role in Kim's tell-all memoir that she was in the process of writing. That is, writing until she suddenly fell ill over a weekend and died alone in her home at only 47 years old. And it just so happened to be on a weekend that her children were away with Diddy, sparing them the trauma of witnessing their mother pass away. While the LAPD initially sent homicide detectives to investigate, the official cause of the death was later reported as pneumonia. 
But keep in mind, this had been a strong, healthy woman with no pre-existing illnesses who had the financial ability to receive the utmost best medical care, but she wasn't even hospitalized. No one was called. She was just found dead. Jaguar goes a step further, claiming... They found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. Now, one important question to consider, did Diddy even know Kim was writing a tell-all? Well, according to what an anonymous source told Tough News TV, Kim wasn't being quiet about it and went out to lunch with her former boss, Andre Harrell. Two, ask him directly if he would finally fess up to his inappropriate relationship with Diddy. And since Andre and Diddy had reportedly reconciled, it's likely that Andre would have told Diddy about it. There's also another way Diddy might have known exactly what Kim was working on. According to bad boy artist Mark Curry, Diddy began tapping her phone to know who she was talking to and where she was. He knew everything she doing. So if Kim, who'd been his romantic partner for all of those years, who would have known all the skeletons in his closet, was actually writing a tell-all that could take him down or at the very least ruin his reputation, would Diddy truly do anything to keep her quiet? Well, according to Blind Items and Jaguar, Diddy allegedly bought Kim a customized casket three weeks before she died. He had her casket ready three weeks before she died. Custom. And then there's Andre himself, Diddy's first mentor, the person who held the alleged secrets that Kim was supposedly trying to get on the record. He died in 2020 of a heart failure. And that's after another original member of Uptown Records also died before reaching old age. Heavy D, the person who actually introduced Diddy to Andre all those years ago. Heavy D collapsed in front of his hotel at only 44 from a pulmonary embolism, which can also be caused by poisons like cyanide, thallium, oleander, and more that can also show up as heart failure or flu or pneumonia-like symptoms. And if you're not given enough of it, they could even cause a coma. And so, of these original founding members of Uptown, the few people on this planet who may have potentially witnessed the true nature of the relationship between Diddy and Andre, the only one that is still alive besides Diddy himself is Al B. Shore, but not without coming close to death himself. In 2022, Al fell into a mysterious coma for months, which can be another side effect of the poisons I mentioned if you're not given a high enough dose to kill you. And though we were given no explanation for Al's coma, it sounds like we're about to get one, considering that Al just announced he's going to be revealing everything about his life and the truth about his coma in his new documentary. You really understand how I ended up in a coma. And he even included a direct reference to Diddy saying, You're really going to need to call Homeland Security. <laughs> the same bureau that raided Diddy's house. And now as a reminder as to what possible motive Diddy would have for these alleged murders, well... They were all writing tell-all books. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book. Kim Porter was working on a book. And I'll be sure was working on the documentary of his life. Basically, any time someone starts to speak up about Diddy, they're magically silenced. Even Terrence Dean, remember? The guy who wrote multiple books and was trying to make a movie off the one everyone associated with Diddy and Andre before he up and died after a mysterious illness at the age of 53? And if Keefe D is to be believed and Diddy wasn't opposed to hiring a hitman in the 90s, maybe he learned from Biggie and Tupac's deaths. After all, guns are messy and draw a lot of attention. More professional hits outside of the world of gangs, where someone simply falls ill and dies, that raises way less flags. So how many people is that that have died in proximity to Diddy? 
We've got Big Jake, Tupac, Biggie, Kim, Andre, Heavy D, and Terrence Dean with alleged attempts to varying degrees on Suge, Kid Cudi, G, and I'll Be Sure. That's 11 possible instances where Diddy could have ordered hits. And if even just one of these is true, who knows how many others there could be that no one even knows about. So now that almost all of the original Uptown crew is dead, are the suspicious deaths going to stop? The problem is, as the walls start closing in around Diddy with the raids and the lawsuits and the new investigations, he's going to have to start shifting into survival mode again. It's not his sexuality or his self-perceived reputation that's on the line anymore, though. It's his freedom and his life too, if the allegations about blackmailing people are true. We know his most recent wannabe music producer protege, Brendan Paul, just got caught allegedly being Diddy's drug mule. Cassie has come out claiming that Diddy abused her and even made her engage with sex workers while he watched. Lil Rod is the one bringing the major lawsuit, alleging that all kinds of celebrities and political figures attended Diddy's wild sex parties and that he was even drugged and assaulted himself by Diddy, the list of people speaking out against Diddy is growing by the minute. But I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you how King of New York ends. Remember, this is a movie that Diddy not only loved enough to recreate, he saw himself as the lead character, Frank White. At the end of the movie, Frank claims that he's not a bad guy, but while in a shootout, uses a civilian as a human shield. If Diddy is anything like Frank, then maybe he's not opposed to using innocent people around him as shields if it means keeping his freedom. Though King of New York ends with Frank firmly cemented as an anti-hero surrounded by the police and then succumbing to his wounds. I'm not saying that will be the way Diddy's story ends, but I bet he's wondered if that's what's in store for him. Maybe he's even hoped for that sort of epic anti-hero ending, but we'll just have to see how this all plays out. I just really hope we can finally get answers and justice for all of Diddy's alleged victims. There are more and more John and Jane Doe's coming forward every week. As we've been covering in our videos on Dan Schneider's sordid history and Drake Bell's survivor story, there are a lot of predators in the entertainment industry that manifest in a bunch of different ways to take advantage of people with dreams. And we're gonna keep calling them out because where there's scandal, there's scandy.